Well, God's given me a word today and I got I to gotta be honest with you. This one has been stirring on the inside of me. I believe it's going to be for somebody in this room today. Turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 9. And we're going to start at verse number 2. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you, thank you everybody watching online and Facebook Live. You mean so much to us. You really do. 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to start reading at verse 2. Verse 1 just gives you some lineage, but I'll give that to you briefly. The scripture is talking about a man by the name of Kish. And Kish, from what we understand, must have been a wealthy man. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Because normally, you were considered wealthy if you had one donkey. If you could even afford a donkey, you were wealthy. And the Bible is going to tell us that he must have had several donkeys. So he must have been a very wealthy man. In verse 2, the Bible says, And he, Kish, had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and the land of Shalisha. I didn't know that was a country. I feel like I've married her before. Shalisha, do you take Jerome to be your lawfully wedded husband? But they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim. And they were not there. And then he passed through the land of Benjamites. But they did not find them. All of this is telling about this, this, this journey to find these lost donkeys. They search day and night. They go from city to city looking for these lost donkeys mile after mile. And they aren't able to find these lost donkeys. This represented a lot of wealth. This, this represented, it would be like you losing, if you owned a moving business, it'd be like you losing all your moving trucks. And so he's out and he's going from city to city, country to country, looking for these donkeys. And finally they come to a city and they know that within the gates of that city, there is a man of God. Now this is not just any man of God. This is the greatest man to hear from God since the days of Moses. This is a man by the name of Samuel. And the Bible says that Saul and his servants said, well, if we can get to Samuel, Samuel will hear from God and tell us where the donkeys are. So they go in and the servant said, but Saul, we can't just go to him empty handed. We have to bring a, a present, a gift to see the man of God. And Saul said, what do we have? And he said, well, we've got a little bit of money. Saul said, well, that'll have to do. We'll have to take that in and offer it as an offering. And, and he'll tell us where we've lost the donkeys. So the Bible says as they're going into the city, they, they come up on some women that are drawing from the well. They ask about Samuel and the women said, well, he is in this city, but there's a chance he's already gone to the high hills for dinner, to have supper. And so they go walking into the city. Now, God is speaking to Samuel because the people of Israel have been crying out for a king. And God says, I don't want you to have a king. I want to be your king. But everybody else had a king and they wanted a king. Now, you know this isn't going to work out in the end, which should tell you that just because everybody else has one doesn't mean you should have one. That's not always a good thing. And so they said, we want our own king. And God says, fine, Samuel, I'm going to give the people what they want. I'm going to give them a king. And Samuel said, who's it going to be? And, and God says, I've already chosen him. I, I know the man I've already selected to be the king. And Samuel, he's in the gate of the city. So Samuel takes off and he goes up to the gate of the city. And sure enough, there stood Saul. And when Samuel saw him, God said, this is the man. And so Samuel walks up to Saul and Saul said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me where the man of God is? I'm looking for the man of God because my father's donkeys have gotten lost and we've been chasing donkeys all over the country and we can't find these donkeys. And Samuel said, son, you're chasing donkeys and God's called you to be a king. And this is what he says in verse 20. Verse 20. 
But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them. They have already been found. We can miss the plans of God because we are so busy chasing trivial things. Saul's life is about to change forever. He's about to be anointed a king, but he still has his mind on lost donkeys. Here's where I'm at. I don't want to miss the opportunities God has for me because I'm out chasing donkeys or running after trivial things. Can I get a good amen in the house? Now, what do these donkeys represent? These donkeys are baggage carriers. They're the ones that primarily we lay our baggage on to carry all of our bags. These baggage carriers represent beliefs, objects, circumstances, that get in our way and keep us from being who God has called us to be. Let me ask you a few questions. The first question is this. What has framed your mindset? What controls the perspective of who you are? Where did the anger come from? The indecisiveness. The insecurity. You say, I was just born this way. I say nobody's born angry or insecure or fearful or indecisive. Somewhere along the way, you picked up that bag and you're still carrying it. So if these are just bags, my question is, why do you keep carrying those bags? Where did that baggage come from? And most importantly, what are you willing to carry today the rest of your life? What if I told you that that bag you keep saying, I can't live without this, was going to cost you your marriage, cost you your family, cost you your job, or even cost you your very life? Would you still be carrying that bag? Here's what I've learned. Not everybody carries the same bag. So I want to talk about some of the bags that we carry this morning. The first bag that we carry is, well, I got to explain this one in the culture we live in today. Girls carry this bag. Boys carry this bag. Can I get a good amen? amen. All right, got to explain that today. You can't take anything for granted. Ladies, you carry a handbag, and this is your daily bag. And, and men, we carry our briefcase. And it doesn't hold that much. It, it holds what we need for the day. It's our daily carry. It's the things that are manageable. And I want to submit to you today that some of you are carrying the handbag, the briefcase of secret sins. The sins that nobody knows about, your wife doesn't know about, your children, nobody at church knows about them because you, they're small enough that you say they're manageable. I don't give in to it all the time. I control when I want to give in to it and when I don't. I, I can handle this sin. It's just a pet sin. Can I tell you something about pet sins? They grow up. And what is manageable today will be destructive tomorrow if you don't deal with it. And some people are carrying the daily bag. Then there's this bag, the duffel bag. Now, I don't carry the duffel bag every day. I carry the duffel bag to special occasions. See, this is my special occasion bag. When I'm going away for Thanksgiving, I'm only, only going to be gone a few days. I, I only take a duffel bag because it's a special occasion. Christmas, I carry a duffel bag. Maybe if I'm going for, to a wedding and I need to change clothes, I will take with me a duffel bag. I, I don't carry it every day. I only carry it at special occasions. And you know if you're carrying a duffel bag whenever you go home for Thanksgiving and your father walks in the room who abandoned you or abused you and you have to sit there and look across the turkey at a turkey and you're saying, you're saying to yourself, "Why well, I can't even believe he would show up. Does he know how bad he hurt me? Does he know how bad he damaged me? Does he know how he left me? And all the feelings of insecurity and all the feelings of rejection and all the feelings of being left alone and all the feelings of abuse begin to surface in your life again and you know you're carrying the duffel bag. 
the special occasion bag or maybe you go home for Christmas and the family shows up that betrayed you and talked about you and look at her sitting over there with a smile on her face opening her Christmas gifts and all that bitterness and all that unforgiveness starts rising up again because you're carrying your duffel bag. Special occasions. Not everybody that cries at a wedding is crying because they're happy. Some people cry at weddings because they're holding on to a duffel bag. And while everybody else is so happy for the bride and groom, they're looking at how their marriage fell apart. And they remember standing there saying the vows. And now all they've got is failure and divorce on their record. And it shows up and they cry, not out of joy. They cry out of shame. It's a duffel bag. Then we upgrade to a suitcase. Now you take your suitcase when you're going on a long trip and the suitcase is for the people who want to get away from it all. The suitcase is for people who want to escape reality. You know, even as a pastor, I can only handle so much of you people and every now and then I got to get away. And I got to get away to where Bermuda, Jamaica, ooh, I want to take you. I, I got to get away where there's sand. I got to get away where there's Caribbean music. I, I got to get away to where, to where I can escape reality and just live in a different world, for, get away from it all. And so I take a suitcase with me to pack up all my stuff so I can just get away from it all. But here's what I found about the suitcase. Whenever I go somewhere with the suitcase, I always come back with more than what I left with and it's usually dirtier. And if you're the person who is always looking for a way to run from reality or escape the life you live. You don't like to be faced with the problems of your life or the reality of your life. You try to run away from it all and you end up coming back carrying more than what you left with. And now you gotta deal with what you left and what you're bringing home to. How do you know if you're walking with the suitcase? I can tell you how. These are the people that are always changing jobs. Well, I thought you had the perfect job. Yeah, it ain't so perfect anymore. No, you're getting faced with reality. These are the people who are always trading husbands or trading wives for a new model because they thought marriage was supposed to be a fairy tale every day of their life. They didn't realize you were going to have disagreements they didn't realize that that same opposite that attracted you is the one you're going to have to live with. And what was, an what was attractive to you when you were dating is annoying to you now that you're married. She's so free. She just, man, she doesn't let anything bother. She just takes life as it comes. That's when you're dating. And when you're married, my God, woman, can you use a planner book? Why can't you be on time for anything? So you change marriages because you don't like reality. These are the people who change churches all the time. My goodness, we have some people that go through growth track. And, and have you ever been a part of a church before? Yes. You know, one? A little more than one. How many churches you been at? Uh, 37. What in the world you've been in so many churches for? Well, you know something was wrong with them. No, the problem was something was wrong with you. And you kept getting confronted with the problem on the inside of you. And rather than deal, what's wrong, deal with what's wrong in you, you keep packing your bags and running from reality trying to get away. Right. Here's, the, here's the problem with the suitcase people. You can change everything on the outside, but until you deal with what's on the inside, nothing will change. Right. And then finally... We got the trunk people. You don't walk around with the trunk. You don't carry a trunk daily. You don't take the trunk on vacation. Do you know where you take the, you put the trunk, put it up in the attic or down in the basement in a dark corner? And people that go to the trunk don't do it when other people are around. 
These are people who like to get by themselves. They wait till everybody's out of the house and then they go down in the trunk and they start digging through the past because all the trunk represents is your past. And you start digging through your past and you pull out the finger painting of the kid who has now grown up and run away or got, got uh, uh, hung up in drugs or they're an alcoholic and, and you look at this little finger painting and tears run down your face because you say, this isn't the child that I raised. You look at the, the wedding photos and you remember how your life fell apart. You, you may have high school pictures, pictures of you and your high school BFF in there. A few years later, you got in a fight and you haven't talked in five years. You don't even remember what you disagreed about. But you sit down there and you look and you think about the unforgiveness and the bitterness. You, you go through, you dig through the trunk of resentment and past hurts and past failures. And you, you dig through the trunk and the, the longer you deal, the dig through the trunk, the more shame you feel and the more guilt you feel and the more resentment you feel to people around you. As long as you live in the past, you can never go forward. And we've got people carrying handbags, daily bags, and we've got the special occasion duffel bag. And some of you are holding on to the suitcase, trying to get away from it all, while others are you, others of you are trying to push. You don't want people close, because if people are close, you can't go dig through the trunk. You gotta push people away. You gotta get by yourself. You have to isolate yourself so you can sit and mope and think about your past. You open the trunk and you relive the emotions of the past. Here's the big idea. The enemy wants to keep you occupied with trivial things. Donkey chasing instead of God chasing. Your donkey might be a mistake, a person, a temptation, a job. But here's what I've learned. There will always be donkeys that are trying to pull you away from God's will for your life. And if you allow them, they will rob you of your kingship. They will rob you of promotion. And they will rob you of God-sized opportunities. My message to you today for somebody in this room is don't let your baggage keep you from God's best. Well, what's in the bags, pastor? Let's talk about it. One of the things we keep in our bags is unfulfilled expectations. When you start digging through the bags, you're reminded that you didn't raise that child the way you thought they would turn out. They've gone the absolute opposite of what you dreamed for their life. And now you live with this guilt feeling like you're a terrible parent because of all the unfulfilled expectations. Proverbs 13, 12 says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. There are people in here that are sick emotionally because hope has been pushed away so many times. Unfulfilled expectations. Here's the second thing that we keep in our bags, untreated pain. Pain that you're not willing to deal with. Pain that you're not willing to admit. In Jeremiah 6, 14, the Bible says, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Can I give you our modern day interpretation of peace, peace? It's all good. How you doing today? It's all good. Is it your marriage falling apart? It's all good. Is it your family being torn apart? It's all good. And you, you're acting like me. See, when I, when I do something stupid and I bang my leg or I trip on something and I hurt myself, I don't like Kim to think that I hurt myself. And so she'll look at me, smack my leg on a table, and she'll look at me and she'll say, are you okay? And I say, Psh, of course I'm okay. Are you sure you're okay? What do you mean am I, I'm out there like thriller? <laughs> yes, I'm okay. And I know it's funny with me, but do you know how silly some of you look coming into church? It's all good. Are you sure it's all good? It's all good. 
And God can't heal what you won't confess. And there are people that have the word and the anointing to bring healing in your life. Let me ask you a question. In the story of the Good Samaritan, do you ever read where the dude that was robbed and beat up laying on the side of the road and the Samaritan shows up and says, man, can I help you? He's like, no, it's all good. Can't feel my face anymore, but it's all good. No, he let the Samaritan pour in the oil and bandage his wounds. And some of you are saying it's all good and you're not being honest. We need some authentic people to say, no, I'm having a breakdown on the inside. I'm full of worry and fear. No, my mar- I need help. My marriage needs help. My children need help. And until you can get real, God can't bring healing untreated pain. How about unresolved yesterday's issues? Excessive dependence on other people. Unresolved. We, we take this to both ends of the spectrum. Some of you live your life to please people and you just can't handle it when somebody doesn't like you. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'll change everything about my life so that they'll like me again. And then others put such a high value on people's opinion that when they do something wrong, they hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness. And they let what they did destroy their life and their family. Some of you are letting people ruin days for you. You've only got a limited amount of days on this planet and you're letting some joker take one away from you. Well, pastor... I'll forgive them when I feel like it. I've learned something about forgiveness. It has a lot in common with exercise. Number one, neither of them is a feeling. Both of them are a choice, and they both hurt when you do it. You don't want to exercise? I don't feel like exercising. Well, you need to. I don't feel like forgiving. It's not an emotion. Forgiveness is a choice, and you need to, and it may hurt at the moment. Yeah, but isn't that letting them off the hook? No, it's letting you off the hook. You don't have to live with their, their pain and their, their hurt any longer. You're getting yourself off the hook and saying, I'm going to let God deal with them. Unresolved yesterday's issues. How about this one? Unrepented sin. Man, I can remember when there would be a time every Sunday for people to come to the altar, and a lot of times we'd come to the altar just to repent. But we, we feel like we've got it so good now that we don't even need to repent. And the Bible calls out things like this, uncontrolled anger, jealousy, wanting what they have, envy, strife, fear. Do you know the Bible calls fear a sin? Dishonesty. Dishonesty. Well, pastor, I'm not a liar. Yeah, but you're a gossip. And that's just, that's worse. That's one of the seven things that God hates. In fact, he names it out about three times in the seven things that God hates. He calls it out about three times. A lying tongue. Somebody that spreads false witness against the brethren. And God says, I hate this. It's sin to me. How do I know if it's gossip? If you ain't a part of the problem or the solution, stay out of it. It's gossip. Unforgiving. A judgmental or critical spirit. Critical spirit. Every time you look at somebody, you you can immediately name 10 things wrong with them and not one thing right with them. That's a critical spirit. Lust. Sexual perversion. Sexual immorality, pornography. Your wife doesn't know what you're looking at at night. Your children don't know how, how addicted you are. It's, a, it's an unrepented sin and it's baggage that you're carrying around. And here's what the psalmist said. He was living in sin. And this is what he said in chapter 32. He said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for night and day. God, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. One of the worst places you can be is a Christian living in sin. Because a sinner that has never met Jesus doesn't even understand the judgment of God. 
But when you've heard the truth and you understand how God feels about sin and then you choose the lifestyle of sin, you feel the weighty hand of God pressing on you and you feel lifeless because of the guilt and the shame you experience every day of your life. This is all, this is all donkeys, folks. This is all baggage that you're letting weigh you down. They're all distractions. And there are people in this room, hear my heart this morning, there are people in this room who are about to miss out on a great opportunity because you're distracted by donkeys. God has called you out. He has said you're next. He has said, I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to elevate you. I'm going to appoint you and position you. But you're chasing donkeys. Distractions. And they'll stop you. It doesn't matter how much God has called you and anointed you and appointed you. If you hold on to the bag, here's what I said in the morning, first service. You can't hold the bag and a scepter. One has to be laid down. Yeah, but God's called me to be a king. You'll never be the king until you lay down the baggage. So when I fly, I have this habit. It's something I do. I'm trying to break it. But, but I always take a carry-on. I take a backpack. And I stuff my backpack full of snacks. Now, most of the time, the flight's only going to last two and a half hours. You can ask him. This is the absolute truth. The flight will only last about two and a half hours. But I've got in my mind that somehow we're going to get hung up there for about 48 hours. And I'm going to be able to meet everybody's need on the plane. I got you. How much? I'm going to become a businessman on the plane. And I, I mean, I pack it with chocolate-covered uh, everything, <laughs> chocolate-covered everything, and, 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 and Sour Patch Kids, and, and yeah. And my favorite is gummy bears. And I don't just take like a little, you know, sandwich bag of gummy bears. I go get like, you know, the hefty bag that stretches, and I pack that thing full of about a gallon of gummy bears, and I shove it down. It, it takes up, the gummy bears alone take up one pocket in my backpack, one whole pocket, just gummy bears. And I like gummy bears. And so, so we, we'll, we'll be getting, going through security, and I'm a gentleman. I always let Sage go first, and she goes through no problem, and I let Kim go through, and no problem, and then I take my backpack, and I set it on the conveyor belt, and it gets into that little mas scanning machine, and the sirens start spinning, and lights start flashing, and over comes the officer, and he's like, holds up the bag, and he's holding it at a distance, like, I got something, he's, sir, is this your bag, is this your bag, whose bag is this, it's mine, sir, please come with me, please come with me, and they take me over to this little area, and everybody's walking by, and they got this look on their face, like, what's this guy doing, man, who is this guy? Anybody see him on America's Most Wanted? He's, look what he's trying to do. And they're going through my bag, and Kim's standing there. She's shaking her head. She's looking at her watch, and Sage is like, Dad, Dad. And they start, they start digging through my bag, and they, they make me pull everything out of my backpack. I got to pull everything out of my backpack. And I got to, and here's everybody, walk, nosy people. There are nosy people in the world. Walking by, just looking at my stuff, just seeing what's in my backpack, seeing what's in my stuff. Can I tell you something? If you hide it, God will reveal it and everyone will see it. But if you open it up to God and deal with it, then he won't expose it to the world. But if you don't deal with it, there will come a time in your life where God will pull back the veil and say, now empty your bag in front of everybody, in front of your wife, your children, the church, everybody. And then they come to that last pocket and they say, sir, our scanners have detected something in this pocket. Is there anything explosive, sharp, anything I should know about in this pocket? And I look at him and I say, it's my gummy bears. And they, they look at me like, are you serious? And they open it up and they pull out this bag of gummy bears and they take their little wipe and they start wiping all over the gummy bears, checking for explosives. And they put it in their little sniffing machine and it comes back and they say, all right, sure, sir, you're, you're free to go. And I take my little gummy bears and I start shoving them back down in the backpack. And Kim walked up to me this after about the 27th time. Kim walked up to me. It happens every time. Every time. And Kim looks at me and she says, if you know they are going to stop you, 
why do you keep putting them in your bag? And that sounds real simple, but it's really profound to some people in this room today. Because if you know that what you're carrying is going to stop you from going to the next level, why do you keep carrying it? Why do you keep putting it in the bag? If you know this is going to stop your promotion or opportunity or hinder, do you know what? When, who, when, they, when they find those gummy bears and all the scanners go off, whoever is with me has to wait on me. And some of you, your marriage is being held back and your family is being held back and your future is being held back because of what you're carrying in your bag. Yes. Am I preaching anybody in the house today? The fact is, there's always going to be donkeys to chase. There's always going to be things that distract you and pull you away and try to get you out of your purpose and, and try to cost you your kingship. And Samuel looked at Saul and he said, son, why are you chasing donkeys? God has called you to be a king. In other words, what he said was, Saul, God has already dealt with the donkeys. You keep walking into your purpose. I want to tell you that God put me here today for somebody. I'm not saying I'm great of a man as Samuel is, but I believe God has put a man of God in front of you today to say, why are you chasing donkeys? It's about to cost you your marriage, your future, your opportunities, your promotion, it's about to cost you everything because you're distracted by the donkeys. And God has sent me here to tell you he has already dealt with your past so he can perfect your future. Don't worry about what's happened to you. Don't worry about what's behind you. Let go of the sin. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Let go of the past hurts and failures. God said, I got a new future for you. So Samuel said, Saul, we're going to anoint you tomorrow and you'll be the king of Israel. So the word goes out. And in chapter 10, the Bible says it's coronation day. And everybody from Israel comes to see their new king. They didn't know who God had chosen. And they're looking around. Who is it? I wonder who it is. I wonder who's going to be our king. Who has the Lord selected? And I don't know if they set the, uh, the, the coronation time at 12 o'clock, but 12 o'clock comes around and nobody stands up. One o'clock comes a ghost, nobody stands up, and people start looking around saying, well, Samuel, where is he? And so Samuel inquired of the Lord, and he said, Lord, you chose him, and now he's gone missing. Where is he? And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 10, that they inquired of the Lord, has he come here yet? And the Bible said that the Lord answered and said, there he is hidden in the equipment. Now there are two things that stand out to me. Number one, God knows right where you are. Even if nobody else knows, God knows. And he said he's hidden in the equipment. And I looked up the word for equipment and guess what it means? Baggage. We're all here so you can be anointed king and go to the next level and here you are over hiding behind your excuses of why God can't do something great in your life. And God says, no more excuses. I'm calling you out of your baggage today. I'm calling you out of your past, out of your failures. I'm calling you out of everything that's the donkeys that have been holding you back. I'm calling you out because I'm taking you to a new level. I'm taking you to a new promotion. I'm taking you to a new opportunity for your family, for your marriage. And you cannot use the excuse of your baggage any longer. You can lay it down and go up to a whole nother level. Do I hear a good amen in the house? In fact, this is what God gave me to share with you. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. 
See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You have been so focused on what has happened to you that you are missing what I'm doing for you. I'm doing a new thing. Stop thinking about the old thing and start thinking about a new thing that I'm doing for you. You ain't never seen anything like this before. I'm taking you to a whole nother level.